Hello and welcome back to the History for Atheists video channel. Here's a story you may have heard. Once upon a time. Once upon a time the brave forward-thinking navigator Christopher Columbus was convinced he could sail to the Indies across the Atlantic Ocean. His study of ancient texts had shown him that the earth was a sphere and there was no danger of sailing off the edge of the world as his ignorant contemporaries feared. As long ago as the 3rd century BC, the Greek scientist Eratosthenes had proven that the Earth was round using reason and mathematics, and this was common knowledge to the ancients. But his wisdom was destroyed with the rise of Christianity. The Church Fathers insisted on the literal interpretation of the Bible and burned or suppressed ancient Greek and Roman learning. The advanced knowledge of the shape of the Earth was thus lost in the dark ages that then descended. And for the next 10 centuries, the church taught that the earth was flat because the Bible said so. But Columbus argued the Greeks had been right and tried to convince Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain to sponsor his voyage to the West. The Catholic Church opposed Columbus and argued for the literal interpretation of the Bible at the Council of Salamanca in 1487, rejecting his rational arguments in favour of superstition and tradition. But the Spanish rulers took a gamble and funded Columbus's expedition anyway. And so, in 1492, Columbus discovered the Americas, demonstrated that the Earth was round, and began a new era, one which started to turn away from ignorance and superstition and embrace reason and scepticism. This is a great story, and it's one that's been told to generations of schoolchildren, particularly in the United States. It's become part of popular culture and even featured in a classic Bugs Bunny cartoon. The only problem is it's complete nonsense. The knowledge that the earth was round was never suppressed or lost. The medieval church did not teach that the earth was flat. It was actually common knowledge that the earth was a sphere throughout the whole of the medieval period. And there was no church objection to Columbus's voyage on the basis of the shape of the earth. Columbus's voyage represents many things, his stubbornness, his strange obsession with apocalyptic prophecy and his greed and inhumanity, but it does not represent some kind of break with medieval superstition and ignorance. This is a myth. Unfortunately, it's a myth that some atheists continue to perpetuate. In April 2019, the atheist activist who calls himself Aron Ra debated a Christian apologist on the topic, has Christianity historically been in conflict with science? Aron argued for the affirmative and based much of his argument on a series of myths and historical howlers that I've critiqued in some detail in an article on the History for Atheist blog. Among them was his claim that the church taught the earth was flat. He claimed the 5th century church father Augustine of Hippo was a flat earther and that this idea persisted in the medieval world as late as the 15th century. As evidence, he presented this painting by Hieronymus Bosch, who he claimed was a Christian monk, a detail of Bosch's life that would no doubt have been news to the artist's wife. This is a stylized depiction of the earth from the front panels of Bosch's triptych, The Garden of Earthly Delights, painted in the last decade of the 15th century. So Aron declares that this alleged monk was depicting the earth as flat as late as that. A few more centuries later, the Christian monk and famous artist Hieronymus Bosch was still painting the earth as a flat disk within a transparent crystal ball, even when Columbus was sailing to the New World, proving the scriptural depiction wrong yet again. So Christianity was still promoting belief in a flat earth 1,800 years after science had already repeatedly shown that the earth is a sphere. And these claims still get some high-profile support from others, including some who really should know better. In 2016, the astrophysicist and popular science educator Neil deGrasse Tyson got into a Twitter dispute with a rapper called B.O.B., who is a conspiracy theorist and who genuinely believes that the Earth is flat. After schooling B.O.B. on some basic high school astronomy and geography, Tyson concluded, Dude, to be clear, being five centuries regressed in your reasoning doesn't mean we all can't still like your music. When one of his followers noted that knowledge that the Earth is round goes back far earlier than five centuries, Tyson assured his 14 million Twitter followers that the ancient Greeks inferred this from the Earth's shadow during lunar eclipses, which is true, but added this was lost to the Dark Ages. 
Tyson has since been shown detailed evidence that this claim is total nonsense, but has never corrected it. No wonder this myth is still so widespread. Exactly when and how the ancient Greeks worked out that the Earth is a sphere is not known. It certainly wasn't inevitable that they'd do so. After all, the Chinese still thought the Earth was flat well into the modern period, despite having an advanced culture and very sophisticated astronomy. Contrary to modern romanticised depictions of the Greeks as rational forerunners of everything scientific, there certainly were ancient Greek flat earthers. In fact, in the 6th and 5th centuries BC, the consensus was very much that the Earth was flat, with flat earth cosmologies held by almost all Greek philosophers in this earlier period. However, opinion began to shift towards the idea of a spherical Earth in a spherical cosmos, and we find the first mention of this idea attributed to Parmenides in the 5th century BC. By the early 300s BC, Plato accepted it as something commonly understood, and after him, Aristotle presented what were to become the standard physical and observational arguments for a spherical Earth in his work Decalo, or On the Heavens. He noted phenomena such as the curved shadow of the Earth on the Moon in a lunar eclipse, or the way a ship disappears over the horizon, or the fact that travellers heading south see southern constellations rise higher above the horizons, as clear evidence that the Earth was round. Flat Earth belief didn't disappear completely. Epicurus rejected a spherical Earth, for example, and Epicurean Flat Earthers persisted well into the Roman era. But they were a tiny minority. The acceptance of the Earth as a sphere was well established long before Christianity arose. And that's how things remained. Christians inherited the conception of the Earth as round and overwhelmingly accepted it. Contrary to popular belief, the idea that the Bible should only and always be read literally is actually a very modern and largely Protestant affair. Ancient medieval Christians accepted that the Bible could be read on various levels and had no problem with accepting that passages that talked about the earth as flat were meant to be read as poetic, figurative or symbolic. Again, there were a few exceptions. The Christian writer Lactantius rejected the idea of a round earth in his book Institutionis Diviniae, written in the beginning of the 4th century. And the 6th century travel writer Cosmos Indiaplustes presented a rather eccentric geography with the earth shaped like a tabernacle, flat with a central mountain that obscures the sun and a sky like the curved lid of a chest. But these Greek writers were rejected by virtually all of their Eastern Christian contemporaries, and their writings were completely unknown in the Latin-speaking West. Knowledge of the sphericity of the Earth survived the intellectual wreckage that followed the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Many Greek works were lost to early medieval scholars in the West, but a great deal of ancient learning survived in Latin summaries and encyclopedias, at least an outline, and in some Latin translations of key Greek works. One of these was Plato's Timaeus, which was widely copied and read in the early Middle Ages. He made the shape of the earth very clear, saying, The Creator made the world in the form of a globe, round as from a lathe, having its extremes in every direction equidistant from the centre, the most perfect and the most like itself of all figures, making the smooth surface all round. Working from this and other references to the geography and cosmology of the Greek consensus, early medieval Christian scholars were able to fill in the gaps. Writing in 725 AD, the Anglo-Saxon scholar Bede produced an influential book on the calculation of time and the calendar, which was widely read across medieval Europe. Bede not only understands that the Earth is round, but also sees how the angle of the elliptic determines the length of days and the seasons. He writes, The cause of the inequality of days is the roundness of the Earth. It is not for nothing that it is called the orb of the Earth in both the pages of both divine scripture and general literature. For in fact, the orb is positioned in the centre of the entire cosmos, not just in a wide circle in the likeness of a shield, but rather in the likeness of a ball, which is identical in equal roundness on every side. And this was in the period in which Western Europe was most impoverished when it came to classical knowledge. Neil deGrasse Tyson's claim that this knowledge was lost to the Dark Ages is pure nonsense, and is more evidence that scientists should really stick to science and leave history to historians. With the rediscovery of scores of Greek works previously lost to the West, 
thanks to translations from Arabic copies in the 12th century, more detailed understanding of the relevant science became available to medieval scholars. From this point onward, the arguments used by Aristotle in Decalo became standard and were found in the textbooks used in later medieval schools and in the universities. By the 13th century, the standard textbook on cosmology was John Sacrobosco's Tractatus de Sphera, or the treatise on the sphere. The title is something of a hint. Sacrobosco summarized the Greek arguments. For example, that the earth too is round is shown thus. The signs and stars do not rise and set the same for all men everywhere, but rise and set sooner for those in the east than those in the west. And of this there is no other cause than the bulge of the earth. Moreover, celestial phenomena evidence that they rise sooner for Orientals than for Westerners. For one and the same eclipse of the moon, which appears to us in the first hour of the night, appears to Orientals about the third hour of the night, which proves that they had night and sunset before we did, of which setting the bulge of the earth is the cause. The idea that the earth was round was so common and widely accepted that later in the 13th century, the theologian Thomas Aquinas used it as an illustrative example of an objective and scientific fact. Both an astronomer and a physical scientist may demonstrate the same conclusion, for instance, that the Earth is spherical. The first, however, works in a mathematical medium, prescinding from material qualities, while for the second, his medium is the observation of material bodies through the senses. The idea that the medieval church taught that the Earth was flat is quite simply a complete myth. It did not. The late Stephen Jay Gould, who, unlike Neil deGrasse Tyson, was a science writer who actually checked his facts when it came to history, summarised it very succinctly. There never was a period of flat earth darkness among scholars. Greek knowledge of sphericity never faded, and all major medieval scholars accepted the earth's roundness as an established fact of cosmology. So where did the myth come from? And if it isn't true, why do people like Tyson and Aron Ra cling to it so doggedly? The myth actually largely arose in the United States in the early 19th century. American historian Jeffrey Burton Russell traces the origins and growth of this myth in his 1991 book, Inventing the Flat Earth, Columbus and the Modern Historians. The roots of the myth can be found in the writings of 18th century French philosophes but it got its greatest popular boost from an American novelist. In the early 19th century, the new nation of the United States was looking for a foundation story. The American Revolution was already taking on something of a mythic status, but many Americans wanted to anchor what they saw as their exceptionalism deeper in the past. Unfortunately, most of their earlier forebears were uncomfortably British, so Christopher Columbus provided a useful alternative. This is why when, in 1828, the popular writer Washington Irving published his new book, History of the Life and Voyages of Christopher Columbus, it became something of a bestseller. Fresh from the success of his short stories, Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, Irving told a crowd-pleasing version of the Christopher Columbus story, where his hero defies the superstitious Catholic clergy and proves that the earth is round, presenting Columbus as a forward-thinking rationalist who turns his back on the darkness of the old world. There was, in fact, something of a debate over Columbus's plans to sail west to the Indies, but it was not over the shape of the Earth, which had been established as round for centuries. It was over the size of the globe. Most scholars accepted the more or less correct ancient calculation of Eratosthenes, but Columbus favoured a smaller figure given by Ptolemy and was also influenced by the work of Cardinal Pierre Dali whose 1410 work, Imagio Mundi, severely underestimated the longitudinal distance between Europe and the Far East. Columbus combined these erroneous estimates with some creative uh, fiddling of his own and managed to convince Ferdinand and Isabella that he would be able to sail to the Indies without running out of supplies. His calculations were all completely wrong, but he was lucky enough to run into the Caribbean roughly where he expected India to be. So far from being a great navigator, his voyage was simply a fluke. Far from being a rationalist, he actually wanted to bring riches to Spain because he believed he lived in the end times and he wanted to help fund a crusade to Jerusalem by the Spanish rulers and so usher in the apocalypse. 
Far from being the man who proved the Catholic scholars to be fools, it was he who got his calculations totally wrong. And the idea that the Earth was round was never an issue in the first place. So the whole story told by Irving is romantic nonsense. But it was popular nonsense. So it became a foundational myth of the United States, was taught to generations of American schoolchildren, and persists in popular conceptions of history to this day. This is why someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson perpetuates the myth, and it's partially why Aron Ra and other atheist activists do as well. The other reason atheist activists like the myth is because it makes Christianity look stupid. Think of our friend Aron Ra. He bolsters his argument against uh, religion by insisting that Christianity was still promoting a belief in a flat earth 1,800 years after science had already repeatedly shown that the earth is a sphere and claims St. Augustine described the earth as a disk suspended in the concavity of the heavens. Unfortunately for Aron, no such description can be found anywhere in Augustine's works. On the contrary, he warned his fellow Christians against making stupid claims on matters of science and natural philosophy, saying, Now it is a disgraceful and dangerous thing for an unbeliever to hear a Christian, presumably giving the meaning of Holy Scripture, talking nonsense on these topics, and we should take all means to prevent such an embarrassing situation in which people show up vast ignorance in a Christian and laugh it to scorn. He appears to have had some 5th century flat earthers in mind when he said this. And several references he makes to cosmology and geography show that in fact he did not think that the earth was a disk and clearly accepted that it was round. For example, in the same work he says, During the time when it is night with us, the presence of light is illuminating those parts of the world past which the sun is returning from its setting to its rising. And thus during the entire 24 hours, while it circles through its whole round, there is always daytime somewhere, nighttime somewhere else. And then later he writes, Although water still covered the earth, there was nothing to prevent the massive watery sphere from having day on one side by the presence of light, and on the other side night by the absence of light. Thus, in the evening, darkness would pass to that side from which light would be turning to the other. These comments only make sense if he is assuming that the earth is a globe. So where does Ron Ra get the idea that Augustine thought the Earth was flat if there's no description of the Earth as a disk anywhere in his works? He seems to have concluded this from Augustine's discussion of something else. St. Augustine said that it was mere conjecture that there might be antipodes, meaning men who walk with their feet opposite ours on the other side of this two-sided coin that he imagined our world to be, according to Scripture. He said there was no reason to believe the fable that people lived on the other side of the world. But he said that 600 years after Aristosthenes had already shown that the world was round and gauged its circumference. So had Aristarchus. Other ancient Grecian scientists like Pythagoras and Axagoras and Aristotle had each followed different lines of evidence to the same conclusion. Here, Aron is referring to something from Augustine's work De Civite Dei, where he says, But as to the fable that there are antipodes, that is to say, men on the other side of the earth, where the sun rises when it sets to us, men who walk with their feet opposite ours, that is on no ground credible. And indeed, it is not affirmed that this has been learned by historical knowledge, but by scientific conjecture, on the ground that the earth is suspended within the concavity of the sky, and that it has as much room on the one side as on the other. Hence, they say that the part which is beneath must also be inhabited. He then goes on, but they do not remark that although it be supposed or scientifically demonstrated that the earth is of a round and spherical form, yet it does not follow that the other side of the earth is bare of water, or even, though it be bare, does it immediately follow that it is peopled. For scripture, which proves the truth of its historical statements by the accomplishment of its prophecies, gives no false information, and it is too absurd to say that some men might have taken ship and traversed the whole ocean and cross from this side of the world to the other, and that thus even the inhabitants of that distant region are descended from that one first man, Adam. If Aron had actually read the passage in question, he would notice that it makes direct reference to the fact that the world is of a round and spherical form. So much for his claim Augustine saw it as a disc. 
What Augustine is referring to here is not any debate about the shape of the earth, but an old and actually pre-Christian debate about whether its far side was inhabited or not. His argument on this matter actually assumes that the earth is round. The ancient Greek conception of the world divided the globe into five climactic zones, two frozen and uninhabitable zones at the Arctic and the Antarctic, an intensively hot zone at the equator, and two habitable temperate zones, one north of the equatorial zone and one south of it. Europe, Asia and Africa, and all of the world known to the Greeks were in the northern temperate zone, in what the Greeks called the ecumene, or the inhabited earth. But there was a lot of speculation about the southern zone. Did it have continents? Or was it entirely covered by ocean? The Greeks regarded the works of Homer as authoritative texts, a little like the way Christians later regarded the books of the Bible. So Crates of Malos, the learned head of the great library of Pergamon, argued that the southern zone had to be inhabited because Homer said so. He cited a line from the Odyssey regarding the Ethiopians who dwell sundered in twain, the furthermost of men, and argued that on each side of the equatorial ocean there lived the Ethiopians, their skin darkened by their proximity to the tropics, divided by the ocean, one group in the northern hemisphere and the other group in the southern, without any interchange between them. So Crates proposed that there were no less than four land masses, the Ecumene, or known inhabited world, in the northern hemisphere, another northern land mass to the west, which he dubbed the land of the Periaeusians, and then two southern land masses, the land of the Antioeusians, and directly opposite the Ecumene, the land of the Antipodeans, since their feet were in the opposite direction to the people of the Ecumene. Antipodeans is the plural of Antipus, with feet opposite ours. He supposed that these continents had to exist to kind of balance up the globe. Of course, this was all completely speculative, but many Greek and later Roman scholars accepted the existence of an Antipodes and thought that they may even be inhabited. Pretty much everyone agreed, however, that any southern continents would be totally unreachable. This was because the equator was considered most likely to be too hot to cross, and even if it wasn't, the distances involved were well beyond the maritime technology of the ancient world. The Roman poet Marcus Manilius writes of these unreachable hypothetical continents in his astrological poem Astronomica, written sometime between 30 and 40 AD. Another part of the world lies under the waters, inaccessible to us. There, there are unknown races of men and unvisited realms, drawing a shared light from a single sun. So this is the context of Augustine's comments on an inhabited antipodes, a long and learned debate of which Aron Ra is, it seems, completely ignorant. Augustine was not arguing against a spherical Earth. He was arguing against the idea that the other side of a round Earth was inhabited, arguing that the Bible said humans were created in Eden, in the northern temperate zone, and so it is too absurd that humans would have crossed to the other side of the world and inhabited this southern continent. Here he is citing his authoritative text, Genesis, to make an argument much as Crates did when he cited his text, the Odyssey. Augustine was a man of his time and an heir to the arguments and debates of the classical world. Because Aron Ra is totally ignorant of history, he has no idea about any of this context. So he has misread a quote from Augustine that he simply didn't understand and jumped to the conclusion that Augustine thought the Earth was a disk. This is because Aron Ra is not only ignorant, but he's also irrationally biased. That conclusion was what he wanted to believe, because it makes Christianity look bad. His other claims about medieval flat earthers in that debate are similarly based on Aron Ra totally misunderstanding the sources he's referring to. Like Augustine, Procopius of Caesarea was not arguing for any disk-shaped world. He was simply arguing against an inhabited antipodes. And Hieronymus Bosch's painting is not evidence that medieval Christians still accepted a flat earth. It's simply a stylized depiction, a visual and thematic prelude of the three-part depiction of the creation of the world in the painting inside. It's not an exercise in geography and cartographic projection. Even Aron's smaller and sillier mistakes are evidence of this bias. For example, he claims that Bosch was a Christian monk, which is totally absurd given that he was a layman and married. But he makes this ridiculous error because he sees everything through the distorting prism of his anti-religious bias, and so has to turn a layman into a Catholic clergyman to fit his silly narrative. 
His combination of ignorance and bias makes this supposed rationalist highly irrational, and his claims about history are garbage as a result. Some other atheist polemicists grudgingly accept that medieval flat earthism is a myth, but still try to claim various medieval scholars were flat earthers when they clearly were not. One that is often invoked is Isidore of Seville. This 6th century bishop wrote a kind of encyclopedia called the Etymologiae, and given that the early medieval period had very few such works of general reference, it was a widely copied and widely read text. Therefore, if Isidore said that the earth was anything other than round, surely this indicates that there was some dispute or doubt on the matter, at least in the early part of the medieval era. And some argued that this passage indicates just that. It is in virtue of its circular form that we speak of the orbis terrariae, the orb of the earth, because it is like a wheel, hence the name for a small wheel is orbiculus. The ocean flowing around the land encircles its limits on all sides and is divided into three parts. The first is called Asia, the second Europe, and the third Africa. Because it is like a wheel, wheels are flat, so surely here Isidore is saying that the earth is flat and round like a wheel. But this is another misreading by those who don't understand the source material. Isidore talks about the shape of the world in several other places and makes it very clear that he understood that it was round. So here he is not referring to the Earth as a whole, which he generally calls a globus, but rather to the Orbis Terrariae. This is the northern temperate zone that I discussed before, the Greek Ecumene that includes Europe, Northern Africa and Asia. He's imagining this zone as a three-dimensional slice with the land masses on the outer rim of the wheel that he's talking about. Other polemicists admit that the knowledge of the Earth's sphericity was not actually lost to the Dark Ages, as Tyson claims, but was only known to the learned. They claim the Church kept the population ignorant, and so most people thought the Earth was flat, even if scholars like Augustine, Isidore, and Aquinas didn't. Of course, the nature of our source material is such that it's hard to know what peasants or even the unlearned nobles generally believed about pretty much anything. But the evidence we do have indicates that, in fact, the shape of the earth was common knowledge and was widely understood and accepted by the unlearned as well. For example, the popular 14th century collection of traveller's tales, The Travels of Sir John Mandeville, includes the story of a man who unwittingly returns to his homeland from the west by sailing into the east. I have often thought of a story I have heard when I was young of a worthy man of our country who went once upon a time to see the world. He passed India and many isles beyond India, where there are more than 5,000 isles, and travelled so far by land and sea, girdling the globe, that he found an isle where he heard his own language being spoken. He marvelled greatly, but he did not understand how this could be. But I conjecture that he had travelled so far over land and sea, circumnavigating the earth, that he had come to his own borders. If he had gone a bit further, he would have come to his own district. This is in a work of tales written for non-scholars and intended to be read aloud for entertainment. Similarly, we have multiple passing references to the shape of the earth in a variety of vernacular works intended for an unlearned audience, which uses the same similes, rond com un pom, round like an apple, or rund com pelote, round like a ball. Romances, which were written in part to be read to an illiterate audience, include references to the earth sitting like a yoke within the egg of the heavens. Both the old French Romain de Aeneas and Le Cronimont de Louis have references to people circumnavigating the earth. The Romain de Thebes includes a description of a map in the tent of a king divided into the five zones of Greek geography, a division that only makes sense in a spherical world. In the Alexandre de Paris, Darius is depicted giving Alexander a present of a ball, implying that he's a child, whereas Alexander declares it a sign that he would conquer the world, showing the audience understood that the earth was ball-shaped. The same poem ends with Alexander's tomb being topped by the statue of him holding up an apple, symbolising his dominance of the whole world. This image would have been familiar to medieval audiences, since royal regalia often included the orb, representing the king's earthly authority. 
In an age where iconography was a shared language for the illiterate masses, the image of a king on his throne holding the scepter and the orb, or rather the globus crucigia, an orb topped with a cross, would have been a very familiar one. And the orb is clearly not a disc. Finally, the 13th century old Norse work, The King's Mirror, depicts a father explaining to his son the way the sun's light strikes the earth using a thought experiment that assumes he already knows that the earth is a sphere. So much for the Dark Ages. Of course, this is not to say that there were not some, or perhaps even many among the unlearned in this period, who had no conception of the Earth as a sphere. Given that in 2012, a survey found that 26% of American respondents were still under the impression that the sun went around the Earth, and we get people like our rapper friend B.O.B. trying to convince people that the Earth is flat even today, it's very likely that there were people who were similarly confused or similarly stupid back then. But there is sufficient evidence that the knowledge of the Earth as a sphere was widespread or even common, even if we can't know exactly how common it was. Of course, the fact that the average person still gets their idea of medieval cosmology from a 1951 Bugs Bunny cartoon is not really the issue here. The, the problem is that the flat earth myth keeps popping up in new atheist critiques of religion, despite it being patent nonsense. If it were just people like Tyson's Twitter defenders, whose grasp of history was so inadequate they still believe this stupid myth, it would not be so much of an issue. But when a man like Tyson, who is regarded as a kind of authority on all things, not just science, and who has 14 million Twitter followers, peddles this pseudo-historical crap, it's small wonder new atheists have a warped view of history. Aron Ra is nowhere near as influential or well-known as Tyson, but as someone who is regarded as something of an authority by many atheists, it's deeply concerning that he takes it upon himself to lecture others on this subject, despite the fact he doesn't have the faintest idea what he's talking about. Incidentally, recently when confronted by my detailed critique of his claims about medieval flat earthism on the History for Atheists blog and forced to respond, Ron Ra very reluctantly admitted that he was wrong. So it seems my blog is doing its job of holding prominent atheist activists to account in their claims about history. But what we see in his original, emphatic and totally erroneous claims on this topic is everything that is wrong with new atheist bad history. Outdated myths, backed by garbled evidence, peddled by non-historians who have irrelevant authority by merit of being scientists, and who are motivated by an emotionally driven ideological bias against religion. The result is, yet again, total garbage presented uncritically by people who are meant to be rationalists and sceptics. And that is the problem. See you again here soon.